for the negative cross-examination of affirmative. Turretin Fan, you have 20 minutes to cross-examine Mr. Albrecht. You may begin when you're ready. Uh, be, 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 before you start, Turretin, I'm sorry for interrupting. I, I, I wanted to let you know, if, if there are any biblical passages you want me to have at hand, if you could tell me ahead of time, because uh, I'm running on a, on a slow computer, so I, I've got to pop it open on my, uh, on my, my Bible itself. Uh, I was I was planning to look at the Zechariah passage that you quoted. All right. And I was, let me let me bookmark them. Okay, Zechariah thirteen nine, I believe, right? Yeah, I was I was actually yeah I was going to look at that. I was going to look at the second Maccabees passage that you mentioned, which was twelve forty four and the following verses. Okay. All right. Let me let me let me just pop them open. <laughs> Sorry about that. My uh, main laptop that I use is uh. It's down right now, so uh, let me. I'll open the Maccabees one, so I won't. I'm doing this, so I won't. So I won't rip off any of your time. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, you can. Uh, you can go ahead and start. Uh, you can start now. I'll go ahead now. I'll, I'll wait till you till you ask me a question. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I'm sorry, just before I get started, it's 20 minutes or 10 minutes? I think it was 20, wasn't it? I'm not too sure. You have 20 minutes. 20, this okay. Is the, this is the first cross-ex for you, Turretin Fan, to, to cross-examine Mr. Albrecht. So the se- okay. the okay. second one would be 10 minutes, so I'm correct, right? Yes, the second one's 10 minutes. Great, okay. okay. Although the second one that's happening next will be your cross-examination. Right, Turtin, right. And you'll have 20 minutes to do that. Right, okay, great. Okay, so I'm muting my mic and ready, set, go. All right. Uh, Thank you very much for your opening presentation. I'd like to begin by directing your attention to Zechariah 13.9. Okay, great. uh, The reason I was directing your attention there is because you had cited this as uh, as evidence of uh, belief in purgatory. No, no, I, th- I think you m- you might have misunderstood me. I mentioned Ze- I, uh, well, Zechariah came up twice actually. I mentioned it first in reading the um, the Jewish Encyclopedia, and then the second time that I brought it up was in reference to the Greek word puros for fire in uh, in the sense of uh, uh, of things that are refined that are uh, refined as they go through the fire. But uh, never did I once say, or nor do I believe that Zechariah thirteen nine. Uh, uh, teaches purgatory or even a purification of a of a human being at all in um in the sense that uh that Catholics believe in purgatory. Okay, so the uh, if you if you begin, I don't know if you can. Uh, l- let me read to you beginning at verse seven. It says, "Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow," saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Now, uh, would you agree with me that this reference to uh, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered is a prophecy about the Messiah? That would be correct. Yes, I do agree. And so would you agree that it's reasonable to interpret this passage as a prophecy about uh, the coming of the Messiah? Sure. And, uh, and consequently to have this, uh, this large-scale destruction of two-thirds – uh, and one third being a reference to something like the the destruction of Jerusalem, where where a huge amount of the people were cut off, but some uh, minority percentage survived. Well, I would agree that um, whereas I don't agree with everything that uh, that the author of the Jewish Encyclopedia has written on this verse, uh, the main reason why I point pointed out uh, this passage in Zechariah. Is because, uh, as we will see later on when I uh, get my cross-examination time and later on in my uh, closing, we'll see that uh, the particular usage of the Greek word poros is found here. And uh, that's the main reason why I use this passage in, in comparative usage of the term in uh, 1 Corinthians 3. But ne- nowhere at all, I want to be clear, 
so that you won't uh, misunderstand. Nowhere at all do I believe that this passage teaches a, 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 a purificatory state or stage or place or, or anything of the right. matter. I understand that you don't believe that, and I, I didn't mean to suggest that you do believe it by asking these questions. What I do want to know, though, is do you agree <clears> that this destruction and purification through fire that's talked about here is something that was fulfilled through the destruction of Jerusalem? And uh, in light of the fact that the, the very next verses, this is 14.1 and 14.2, says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So something like a destruction of Jerusalem, whether it's the, first, the you know Babylonian destruction or the destruction in the time of uh, the, apost you know, the, the, the apostolic era, but, uh, but something like that, would you agree that that's what this is talking about? Absolutely, yes. There, there's definitely a, a destruction being spoken of here. I, uh, I apologize that I'm not able to comment on it further. I, I honestly did not uh, you know, study the passage in depth. I, in fact, the, the main reason I, I've already told you why I mentioned it was yes, not at all in dealing yet. Yeah, but uh, if, if that's what you're – if you've studied it in depth and that's what you're saying, well, I, I sure don't see – I don't see any, any conflict with uh, – with the position that I'm putting forth, uh, I definitely do see, as you pointed out, a, a destruction being referred to here. I, I've got no problem with that. Now, this uh, this word, <coughs> uh, me. this purification with with uh, through fire, that then could be something that takes place in this life. Not in oh, absolutely, life. without a doubt. Oh, absolutely. I, I'll, I'll be clear one more time. I apologize for not pointing out in my opening statement, but definitely the usage of puros. In fact, I would argue the majority of the times is in reference to something occurring in this life. I would agree 100%. I've got no problem right. with that at all. Yeah, but but nevertheless, that's uh, that may be may become significant in our discussion. Yes, I think I'm it will sure be. I think I, I think it will be. That's why it's good to to pretty much get it set out so you can see exactly what my viewpoint is on this. Yes. So. Uh, Turning, if you'll turn with me to Second Maccabees, <coughs> this was another. Absolutely, I've, I've got that open. Second yes. Second Maccabees, chapter twelve, and uh, verses. Well, I'm going to be referring specifically to verse forty. Uh, the the context around verse forty four. Right. Uh, but the the context uh, really starts. Uh, I think you mean forty three, right? To to forty six, because forty three is where we read that uh, well, the gathering. Yes, the uh, the re I, I think the place I would start with is actually at verse 38. Okay, I'll, great. I'll read it to you. Uh, so, so Judas gathered his host and came into the city of Adullam, and when the seventh day came, they purified themselves as the custom was and kept the Sabbath in the same place. And upon the day following, as the use had been, Judas and his company came to take up the bodies of them that were slain and to bury them with their kinsmen in their father's graves. Now, under the coats of every one that was slain, they found things consecrated to the idols of the Jamnites, which is forbidden the Jews by the law. Then every man saw that this was the cause wherefore they were slain. All men, therefore, praising the Lord, the righteous judge, who had opened the things that were hid, betook themselves unto prayer, and besought him that the sin committed might wholly be put out of remembrance. Besides, that noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves from sin, for, as much, uh, for so much as they saw before their eyes the things that came to pass for the sins of those that were slain. And when... He had made a gathering throughout the company to the sum of 2,000 drachms of silver. He sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly in that he was mindful of the resurrection. For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should have risen again, it, would, it had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And also in that he perceived that there was great fa favor laid up for those that died godly, it was an holy and good thought, whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. So in, in light of that context, would you agree that these men who died 
were partakers in idolatry. Without a doubt, we can see that the men died. They had idols, and definitely they, a number of them were uh, idolaters. We don't know if they um, – of course, we don't know if, if all of them ever repented or not. But uh, definitely they did have idols. That is uh, without a doubt. Uh, and and that was the reason why they died. It was Absolutely. The sin of idolatry. Absolutely. They, they, and, were, they were killed, yes. Uh, do you think that there's any reasonable basis on which someone could say that they were unaware that the law prohibited idolatry? I don't think so. I really don't think so. A number of individuals perhaps it could have been – well, I, I, I would agree that everybody – was aware that idolatry was condemned, but a number of those individuals quite possibly did not think that the, what they were participating in was indeed idolatry. But yes, I believe every Jew was aware that idolatry was condemned, was not acceptable at all. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, if, if, assuming that they understood that the things consecrated to the idols of the Gemnites were forbidden by the law, and they nevertheless were doing it, wouldn't that appear to meet the definition for mortal sin? Well, it's a very good question that you bring that up, because uh, there is nothing in the verse that even hints that these individuals died in mortal sin. I would say that I definitely do agree idolatry is sinful, but for, furthermore, if we continue reading the verse, verse 45 is rather explicit when it says that there was great favor for those that died in godliness. And then we, we actually encounter the very Greek term musabias. And I believe that this is clear proof that these individuals, some of them, of course, I can't be speaking for all of them, but at least the author believes some of them, died in godliness, but with vestiges of, st of sin still in their souls. So I think this passage, I, don't, I do not think that this passage is clear, that all of these individuals, or even any of them for that matter, died with what would be labeled as mortal sin. So, you know, having on your body I idols and it being said that God killed you on account of the sin of idolatry is not enough to show that there is mortal sin, if I understood your answer. Well, for the fact of the matter is, if we examine this passage, we definitely do see that these individuals had idols. The, the fact of the matter is we aren't aware, we aren't told in the passage that all of these individuals died being idolaters. We aren't told these individuals were killed without have, ever having repented. In fact, we're told very little about them. But the one thing that I think is rather explicit is when we encounter verse 45 that says that, they, that, that uh, it was great favor for those that died in godliness. And once again, I find the term that the author which, of course, you, do, you believe this book to be apocryphal. I believe it to be the, the holy word of God. I believe the author to be God himself. So when I encounter the Greek term usabias, I view that as clear proof, that, clear, excuse me, clear proof that, these, that these individuals died in godliness, but with what I would call venial sin, lighter sins, vestiges of sin still in their souls, which allow prayer to be given for them. And uh, the and your basis f for that was the the fact that it says and also in that he perceived that there was great favor laid up for those that died godly. It was an holy and good thought. That is correct. That, yes, verse and, forty-five, I believe. Yes, and um, after that we those, read. Oh, excuse me, sorry about that. And what? Uh, which people are those to whom he refers that those, those that died godly? Well, again, once more, that's the interesting part. We don't know, and I believe that the, that the individual speaking isn't aware of if, if all of them or a few of them or even what number of them died in God's favor. But the interesting thing is, is that uh, we read that it says, and also in that he perceived that there was great favor laid up for those that died in godliness. It was a holy and, ho and good thought. What I, right after that, we read, whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead so that they may be, be delivered for their sin. The very fact of the matter that the author believes that they died in godliness, in Usabias, allows him to, uh, to make a reconciliation for the dead so that they can be delivered from the sin that they are suffering. And of course, uh, the belief in purgatory entails that we believe that individuals are undergoing some sort of suffering in the afterlife. And I think this passage is a perfect example 
of a belief in an ancient Judaic belief in purgatory. 